Hello and welcome to another deep dive. So this time around we're going to be taking a look at something called the input system and in particular what we're talking about here is the input system package. It's a newer method for working with input uh, that is a replacement essentially for the built-in uh, input manager that previously existed and has a lot of advantages over the uh, previous system, the, the legacy input one there. So to add it, I need to go to package manager. It's going to be within the unity registry. So I've already got that selected, uh, which is good. And then once the list populates, I'll be able to come down to input system. And then I want to install that. Uh, so the new input system has a number of advantages. It works really well uh, across different platforms and different input devices. The range of input devices that it provides really good support for is excellent um, and very easy for working across different platforms there. Uh, it also has built-in support for doing haptic feedback with those, so you can do controller rumble uh, quite easily. So the thing that you'll typically see when you are installing it is you'll see this message. And what it's saying is, okay, well, the Currently, Unity is set to be using the uh, legacy input system, the old APIs. So I need to allow it to uh, use the new ones, which what it will do is there's a little bit of processing it does, and then it will actually restart the editor, um, which we'll see in a moment. Get to see my uh, lovely Mass Effect Andromeda background. Uh, this was a, actually a screenshot that I took. Um, not particularly relevant to the input system stuff we're looking at, but it's a cool background and I really like it. Uh, so the new input system works a little bit differently as well. So the old system only works in a pulp mode where we would specifically ask for data from it. We would say, okay, is this button pressed? Is this key pressed? Um, so we could do that specifically uh, with the old system. Uh, the new one is you can actually poll it like that, but it also is able to be event driven. Uh, so by event driven, I mean that it can result, it can actually cause uh, your code to run in response to stuff happening. The new input system also works really nicely for if you're working with uh, local co-op. So having multiple players on the one device, uh, there's some really good support for that. Uh, there's also some excellent samples built in. Uh, so it has examples for doing things like uh, control rebinding. Um, so rebinding UI. So there's examples there for being able to do rebinding. And it's a rebinding approach where you, know, you say, yep, I want to rebind this key. And then it can listen for what key is pressed. Uh, so really great setup there for it. Um, there's some really cool things here uh, in the samples. You can't see the samples until you've got the package installed, but once you do, uh, if you check in package manager, you'll see then the samples. And this is the same for a bunch of the packages here as well. Once they're installed, there will actually be at times additional things that you're able to see. So, okay, input manager. Let's set up something really basic. Uh, so with the legacy input system, one of the things I showed uh, was just a really simple uh, thing for I was moving around uh, and I initially showed that being done using a polled based uh, movement approach. Uh, so I'm going to set up a similar thing here and I'm going to demonstrate a couple of different things with this. Because um, I want to demonstrate that that fact that we can still use it in the polled mode, uh, which that polled mode can be really handy as kind of an intermediate, as a stepping stone if you're converting old code over to new code, uh, can be really handy from that point of view. Because when we have switched over the uh, back ends to the new input system, which if we go to our project settings, we can actually see what's controlling the input handling. Uh, when we've done that switch over, then that means that's that has to be used for everything. If we try to use the old input methods, we actually get an error. 
Um, so that's something that we need to keep in mind. So I'm going to set up my materials. So as always, gonna, and it would help if I tried to drag that into the scene view. Uh, bring that in here. I'm also gonna bring my game view down here because I don't need it to be particularly large. There we go. A nice grayish ground. And then we are going to have a cube. Uh, and let's bring that cube a little bit up so that it's floating on the surface. So we're gonna demonstrate a couple of different methods of using the new input system. So the first approach is going to be a polled method. Uh, so method one, hold. Uh, and I'm gonna set these up as separate scripts. They're not really something where you would normally on the one uh, object, you know, switch between different methods. So this is gonna be polled. So, Similar to what I've done previously for doing things like of this. Well, I know I'm going to need a uh, movement speed control. Movement speed. I'm going to make that two. Uh, so with this, I'm again using serialize field on the basis of this is not a variable that I need to be able to access outside of this class. Uh, but it is a variable that I want to be able to control in the inspector. So to access the new input system, I need to be adding in a using Unity Engine input system. And then what I can do from that polling point of view, so I'm gonna set up a vector three uh, desired movement. Uh, and I'm just going to start that as being a zero vector. And then what I'm going to do is F keyboard current. So the currently uh, connected keyboard. And then I can check for the different keys. So I could, I've still got my stuff for checking, you know, any key, things like of that. So I can check if the W key, uh, and I can check if it is pressed. So we've got is pressed. So that'll work for if it's being held down. Uh, so if it is pressed, <clears throat> then I could say, well, my desired movement, I'm going to add to that. Uh, so W will move forwards. So we'll say that that will be transform.forward. Uh, otherwise, if keyboard current S key, is pressed, then the desired movement would be transform. Ah, oh, we don't have backward. Fine, I will subtract transform.forward. So update for forwards, backwards. And then we'll also have for left and right. So for left and right. So if we press the D key, then I want to add in transform.right. Oh, do I have a little, no, of course I don't have a left. At least it's consistent. Uh, and then that will be the A key. Because then for moving the actual object, what I can say is my transform position. I add to that desired movement by movement speed by time dot delta time. So this is the equivalent of if I was using get key. Uh, we also, under those keys, I can do things like uh, keyboard current, if I pick whichever key, let's go for B. Uh, I've also got was pressed and was released. So those are our equivalents of was pressed is the equivalent of get key down. Uh, so it tells you if it was pressed this frame, uh, was released this frame is the equivalent of the get key up. So we can still access all those same ones. So if we're transferring uh, code that we've previously used, those are things that are available. 
Uh, these keys are a thing that's defined here, so they're a uh, key control. Um, so we'd be able to be linking to those if we need. Uh, but this should give us the movement that we are after. Uh, now, it is a, as I said, it is a poll-based approach. Uh, we're not getting the niceties that we would get from using things like a get access or stuff like of that, but that's okay. What we want to just do is confirm that, yep, we can move uh, in that polled sense. So that's behaving the way that I would expect it to, which is good. So, okay, cool. Polled method of movement, that works. Uh, let's set up a, another method of movement. So this is going to be sphere. Uh, and this, I'm going to actually use the player input set up for this one. Now the sphere, I'm going to move it so it's uh, definitely not that height. There we go, two up in the air, uh, just so I can see where it is. So this is something where what I can add in is, so this would be what I would use on an actual player. So we've got this thing of a player input. Uh, so I can have my player input script and then I'm going to set up my method to player input. And we're going to link that up. And then we'll see how this works. So player input is what I normally uh, would make use of for like a character controller, things like of that. So, okay, we've got a couple of things here. Uh, and you know, it's already telling us we don't have these input actions associated. And these input actions, these are one of the things uh, that I truly love about the input system that makes it so incredibly powerful. So I'm going to create actions uh, and I'm going to give these their own separate folder. I'm going to call it input configs actually uh, and I'm going to refer to this as default config. So we'll create uh, that and look like it actually hit into an error there. That's an interesting one. Uh, there. There might potentially be a bug in the input system. I'm sure it will be fine and nothing could possibly go wrong. Uh, just waiting for my fire alarm to now start going off. That would be very on brand. Uh, so I can take a look at the config so I can edit this. And as I said, this is one of the things that is incredibly powerful with this because we have this idea of action maps. So an action map is the kind of the context uh, for a particular set of commands. So if we were doing a game where a player can move around just freely, you know, they're a, a humanoid or some other character that's just sort of walking, ambling around, then we would have, you know, specific controls for that. But now say that player is in a vehicle, maybe they're in a, a ground-based vehicle. Okay, we'd have slightly different controls there if they were in a you know, something that's on water, different set of controls. If it was underwater, if it was in air, if it was in space, different control schemes. Those different control schemes would be a different action map. So an action map corresponds to a control scheme. And when we create an action map using uh, the player input, we get a bunch of default things in here. So we have these actions. So this is functioning a little bit similar to the input manager where we had the uh, axes and where we had the buttons and so the things having a particular name. So if we look under the move action, well, we can see it's saying move, it's a vector two, which makes sense. So we've got horizontal and vertical components uh, that we could then interpret however we need. But if we expand this, we can see, okay, well, it supports the left stick on the gamepad it'll work with WASD. And if we expand that, actually is not just WASD, it's also the up arrows and down and left and right. So this one thing is mapping to the left stick, 
to WASD. It also is going to be working for the uh, virtual reality controllers and just for a standalone joystick. This is one of the truly powerful things with the new input system that you define these actions and then you define, well, here are all of the different control schemes that this applies to. And you can see that it's actually indicating which control schemes because the input system knows which types of things are connected. And we can seamlessly switch. If you've played a game where when you plug in a controller, it can then uh, change the prompts that appear on the screen so that now you see the ones based on that controller's buttons, the new input system lets you do that because with the new input system, you can find out when a controller is being connected or disconnected. So it's super powerful. So by default, we have our ones built in for move, for look, uh, for fire. We can easily chuck in additional ones. Uh, and you know, these can also be duplicated, copied and pasted. So if we like the behavior of the fire button, but then we wanna use that same thing for jumping, then all we would need to do is duplicate and we rename it to jump and then we can change all of the controls that that links to so really powerful setup being able to have this uh, you know when you're linking up the particular buttons so as well as being able to manually go and select ones you can also hit listen and then you just press a key uh, really, really powerful for setting stuff up. You don't run into the issues that were there with the input manager where you could get differences uh, with joysticks when, when it's on, you know, Windows versus Mac, things like of that. Those behave really nicely with this system. Uh, as you can tell, I might be a little bit of a fan of it. Uh, it also already has the built-in stuff there for working with the UI, which the, which the previous one did as well. It's just a little bit more comprehensive in that, again, it's covering you know, joystick, uh, all of the different interactions, things like of that. So again, really powerful because uh, it's also making use of things like uh, VR. So new input system, when you're working cross-platform, working with all different devices, I really can't recommend it. Uh, more strongly and we have so many different you know types of things that we can get out so we can get you know the movement gives us out a vector 2 looking also does that fire is a button type one so we just get a yes or no essentially but we can set up extra interactions and processes on these so interactions allow you to customize behavior for the particular types of things that are happening Processes allow you to change the value that's coming out. So if you wanted to scale the value, if you wanted to normalize it, handle dead zone, things like of that, these are things you can add onto the processes, either on the action at the highest level or just actually the individual components of it. So we can add in a process or an interaction just for keyboard input, for example. So super powerful. Um, but let's see how these actually work. So if we look at the player input, and it has, again, its behavior here is a really important thing. This behavior controls how this information gets to us. So there are different ways that we can access this information. So it can happen via send messages or broadcast. Uh, it can happen via Unity or C Sharp events. So we've got different ways that we can actually access this information, uh, depending upon what we're wanting to set up. And you know, obviously, if it's using messages, it's only going to go to you know this object. Uh, but if we were using events, we could be redirecting those, and we can see when we do that. Events tells us here are the different ones. Uh, for the different action maps. So it makes it really easy to know what you need to set up. Uh, but we can also just have this work for send message. And we can see it'll send message to the game object. Uh, if we you know, change to broadcast message again, it tells us. So it gives us a lot of really good info. And we can see the particular names that it is going to be sending. Super handy. Really great to be able to know that. Because what that means is if I go and edit my code 
and I'm actually going to edit my code uh, with this up because what I can see then is what I'm actually working with here. So I can see, okay, uh, so these are the ones where we're talking about uh, stuff being connected. So we have things like device lost, device registered, but I'm going to initially just set up. So we have our on move and we have uh, I'm just actually going to hook up that one. Actually, no, I'll hook up on fire as well. And we know that on move certainly has information, but we want to just see. Just going to do this step by step and show, okay, well, how do we figure out what stuff we put in there? So it's going to be on move. So this will just be a way of me saying, okay, is anything actually happening to start with? Um, and we'll have this running. So we'll just see if we actually get anything coming through in the console. So we are getting fire uh, and we are getting movement messages. So those are coming through uh, every time I click or press uh, whatever any of the fire keys were. Can't remember what the other fire key was. Um, we've also got a controller connected up, uh, which the controller we can see when I press the trigger, I get fire messages coming through. If I use the sticks, I also get movement messages coming through. I get a lot more than I would with the keyboard for that fact of, well, it's a it's an analog stick, so there's a lot more range of values that can be coming through. So, okay, I can see that I am getting uh, messages coming through, which is good. I need to work out the particular set of data that's coming through to this though, because I know move, uh, certainly has additional data that could be coming through to that. And it would be nice to have it be processing the particular data. So there's a few different ways I could go about getting this. Uh, I am going to go for uh, one method initially, which I reckon will do the trick uh, for on move and on fire, where what I'm going to do is actually attach a debugger with breakpoints on those. Uh, and I want debugging for all projects. I'm definitely going to run into bugs with plenty of things. Uh, but by attaching the debugger, what that should mean is that I can intercept when that send message is actually fired. So I can hopefully then pick up uh, what inputs it's trying to provide. So if I go to move, then we've hit our breakpoint. Uh, and then what I can do is I can see and Visual Studio Code is not happy with me. That's uh, less, there we go. Oh, and I had to do that. Uh, for whatever reason, Visual Studio Code was grumpy. So let's try that again. Uh, so it's broken in, there we go. Now I can properly see the call stack. So if I go a bit further up to where it's sending the message, uh, I can see that it's sending this thing an input value object. Uh, so, okay, let's track down what the input value object is. So that seems like it's a fairly uh, generic uh, thing that it's using. So I can take a look and see input value object. So it's an input value. Uh, okay, so what that should mean is that then in here, I wanna have uh, input value value. Uh, and I might need to make that be, I think that was under input action. Uh, or is it input action context? Nope. Uh, 
would be really helpful if I'd kept that other file open. Oh, I know what. Using Unity Engine Input System. So always remember and include the input system. So I need that for both of these. So let's output how, what that value is. So if we take a look and see what's in there. Uh, so we have this is pressed value. That looks like a good one for the on fire one. Now on move, if I want to see what I've got for value for that, well, I can see it's got this get option. So I know that in the config here, move was a vector two. So let's try that. Let's see what happens if I try and get a vector two from it. And let's see uh, what we're getting for output here. I am going to turn off collapse uh, just so we can see better the data that we're getting. So it's up and running. So I'm going to press W. So, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to press S, D. So those are working. Uh, so now if I go to the controller and move the left stick around, then you can see fully to the right gets one fully up. So that is giving me a value. I can see its value is going to always range from uh, minus one for down and to the left uh, to positive one for up and to the right. Although it never actually fully hits that. I would have a feeling it's there's a level of scaling happening there. So it never fully hits it, but that's fine. That's workable. Uh, and we can see the fire button. So fire, I am going to press the button and I'm holding it. So as long as I'm holding it, I am continuing to get the fire messages. As soon as I release it, I get a couple more where it's saying that it's not pressed. So I could key off the fact that it has been pressed and use that for performing an action. Uh, so let's link this up. So my movement here is now keying off. I'm going to turn off these so that my movement is going to be controlling the behavior. So we've got a difference here though of, well, I still want the movement to be happening in update because especially if I was working with physics stuff, I would want to be controlling the movement in fixed update. So what I often would do for stuff like of this is when I've got uh, input, then I can actually be storing that. So what I could say is uh, cache move. I'm going to default that to zero. And then what I would say is, okay, cached move is equal to value get vector two. And I could also then just have here as cached move, which I just set to true. So I'm caching the input data. Then down here, I check, okay, have I got cached move? I do. So first thing I do is I clear it. And then I can apply that movement. And I'm just going to steal my values from here, uh, where then what I would be doing, can grab this. So my desired movement, oops, no, I didn't start. Uh, that would be down here. Uh, so what I would be doing is, okay, well, my transform position, uh, my desired movement, which I'm just gonna set that up in a separate variable, just uh, for cleanness of the code. So that's going to be my new vector three, uh, and that's going to be my cached move X zero cached move Y. Actually, no, I can use the forwards and everything. So cached move dot Y times transform dot forward, uh, plus cached move dot x times transform dot right. 
So let's see what this does. Uh, it should mean that we get uh, similar movement sort of happening there. So I'm running this and then, okay, it's up and running. So I'm trying to move. You can see I'm not getting any movement happening of the sphere. Uh, so if we take a look at what is happening, we should be caching these values when we get the move input. Um, so what we could be doing in this case is if we turn these debugs back on uh, and then check and see what is happening. Just so we know that we've got input coming through and that's thing, it's a new system so you can run into uh, errors that you might not be used to tracking down. So I'm pressing to move forwards, but the sphere is not moving at all. And if we take a look, well, we, are, we are using our cache move down here. We should be storing it. Um, what we can do is we can come down here and check and see what's actually getting calculated for this to make sure that the, the values there are making sense, that we're uh, processing and applying them correctly. So we run it. And we won't have any cache move initially, but if we hit W, we're not getting anything coming through. So that seems strange because we are checking our values here. Oh, it would help if I attach the debugger. Ah, let's try that again. Now with the debugger attached, simple errors to run into. So, okay, we can, it's broken into uh, Visual Studio here, takes a moment. Uh, we can see the cache move has a Y value, which is correct. Uh, we can also see the cache move doesn't have an X, which is also correct. So we should then get a valid desired movement. Uh, so our desired movement is, is valid. So it should be taking the position and that position is currently zero to zero. Uh, so we would be expecting it to change a bit because we've got a movement speed of two. Uh, we would have a valid time delta time. So we should see our position change slightly. And so it has changed. It's changed very, very slightly. Um, so it's moved, has moved a bit there, the sphere. So it seems like it's running. Uh, and if we just watch what's happening, then the sphere changes, but we don't get anything further. And that, is because of a thing in terms of how it works with the keyboard. If I try with the controller now, it does move. So this is a difference in behavior with the controller versus the keyboard. So when the uh, input is the same, we stop getting values through there for the keyboard. So what we can do is we can go and take a look at our action map set up here. And we can take a look and see, I'm going to turn the debug logs here back on and I'm only going to use the W key because there's actually something that's not correct in what we set up. We set it up based upon what we thought we needed to do, but it's actually not what we need to do. So let's run this. So I'm going to press and hold the W key. So I've gotten one message, then I release it and I get a zero. So I actually don't, this caching, no. The caching is actually the problem. The input system is going to tell me when that input changes. 
So I don't need to do anything fancy. You know, I thought, yeah, no, it makes sense that I needed to do some extra caching of the stuff. Nope, input system is clever and it will tell you when it's changed. So it's actually only feeding you new data, typically, when that data changes. So if something, if you stop getting an input, it will tell you that you've stopped getting that input. Um, if that input changes, it will tell you that it's changed. We don't need to, so this is the big difference in terms of working with something that's polled versus something that's event driven. Uh, it's going to tell us when things change and when we need to do something differently. So that means I can see that I can just be moving it as normal. I don't need to do any caching. Uh, we'll notice the square is moving faster and that is because uh, the input system is normalizing my axes a bit there so that we don't have the thing of, hey, you can move faster on the diagonal. Uh, which is very easy to have happen. And I can then move this with the controller really easily, really fluid movement. Would have noticed before when I was moving with the controller, the movement was at times a little bit uh, janky. It was a little bit uh, times where it was sort of stop starting. And that was because if I, and it's really hard to do with a controller, uh, it's really, you know, having it that the movement is perfectly exactly the same as what it was last time uh, is a lot harder to do with the controller but it was still encountering cases where the input was exactly the same and it doesn't fire that event again so that's an important thing with the input system we get events when stuff has changed uh, so send message is a perfectly valid way of picking these up uh, I could have it use the event based method as well. Uh, so if I switch this over to events, so it's only ever using one of them at a particular point in time. Uh, if I wanted to use the event based one, we can see the information here comes through slightly differently. Uh, so these uh, used for send message mode uh, and those names have to be exact uh, but what I can have is an on move event mode and we can see these take in a callback context and from memory these are under input action callback context so these give us slightly different data. So we'll have the on move, and I will also have the on fire event mode, input action, callback context, context. So these do work a little bit differently. Uh, if I link these up, then we'll see they'll be running but we still need to get the data obviously from them. So let's link these up uh, and you will find these uh, ones there under, that's right, they also, when you're using these events, for an event to be visible in the inspector, it must be public. So with that public, then we can link these up and you see the events get grouped by the action map that they're under. So under our script, there'll be the, it's the dynamic ones we want. Uh, so not, they won't be listed down here, fortunately, but we specifically want dynamic ones. Uh, that means the parameters get properly passed through. So, okay, we'll have our on move and on fire. Uh, and let's take a look at the context and see what information is there within the context. So contexts, we can do a read value. So if I do a read value as a vector two, and I'll do that for the cached move, for fire, what I'm going to do is, because fire is a button, so context, I can say read value as button. 
So let's see what we get back with that. Uh, and for that one, I'm going to say fire and then the value, just so we can sort of see what are we, what are we getting there uh, for the outputs. So what we would be hoping to see is that the movement works exactly as it did before. Uh, so let's check that first. So, yep, I can move around exactly as I could before. Uh, let's press and then hold fire. So I've pressed it, nothing happening. Uh, we can, oops, there we go. Got a bunch of stuff. So we're getting a lot of exceptions uh, that are coming from the input system. So looks like it's having a lot of issues with trying to read from stuff. Uh, and in particular, grabbing stuff from the mouse. Uh, so it did get the fire one and output that, but then it did run into a bunch of issues. So let's just try this again, see what might be causing the particular problems. Uh, so it's really, really quite grumpy at us. Uh, and we can see that the fire one in particular is causing that. So what we're going to do is just to narrow down where this might be coming from. Uh, we'll get rid of our reading of the fire one there. See if that's a, a contributing factor. And I'm going to turn on collapse again. Um, so, okay, we're, we're not getting any of those messages and we can move around so that's working okay uh, so let's just check our fire one so we have said that the action type is a button uh, and we are trying to we did try to read it as a button but let's take a look and see what other options we've got there so you know, we can check our value type uh, could be a useful thing to actually log out because so that we can make sure that we are actually reading things correctly. Because even though I've said button, you know, the, the trigger buttons on a controller, the fire button there, it isn't just an on or off. It does actually have a range of zero to one. So we might be encountering issues with that. So it's actually telling us that it's getting a vector two there. Now that seems particularly odd, and I have a sneaking feeling I've done a silly thing. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we've illustrated what happens if we link up to the wrong thing. Uh, so that was why I was getting messages where when I did fire, it was talking about a vector two. Uh, that was because I linked it up to the wrong thing. So it is possible to do that because they all take the same type of parameter. So you can very easily link them to the wrong thing. Uh, I would love to say that that was an intentional error to show and educate you about the particular problems that can occur. Uh, it wasn't. So, okay, that looks better. We're getting back a single, in other words, a floating point value. Uh, so we can switch this back to read as button and then take a look and see how that behaves. Uh, so as you can see, it's very easy to hook things up to the wrong inputs there. Uh, so we do need to be cautious of that. So with our fire one getting true, and then we get a false on release. Uh, if I use my controller, then we are getting a whole mix of ones. Let me turn off collapse. We'll make it, I think, a little bit easier. So I'm gonna press and hold in the button. So let me tap that active. So I'm pressing and holding in the fire button now. So we're getting a whole bunch of the trues come out and then I release and we get a few more trues and falses. And that's because the controller button is an analog one. So it does have a zero uh, to one range there. And I would find if I was just sort of slowly moving the input a bunch. I'm getting a whole bunch of falses because I'm only moving it a little bit um, and I, until I move it past the halfway point. 
Uh, so that is something to be aware of if you are doing stuff that's working with a controller that you know, your fire button there is analog. Whereas when you're doing keyboard and mouse, uh, the fire button is typically going to be a digital one. It's either on or it's off. Uh, whereas with the controller, it can be in different stages of on or off. So you can get multiple ones there. So if you're doing something where you are wanting to have it be firing, but you have a fire rate, then you need to make sure you've got cooldowns happening in the code. So it's not trying to do that firing too often. So, okay. We can get our fire inputs, we can set up and customize these action maps, all a really cool sort of setup. Uh, we also, with this, you know, I was saying that we can tell if a device has been uh, added or removed, which we can. We have these events for device lost uh, or device regained. So I'm going to set up those. Uh, so public void on device lost event mode. Again, these exist in the send message mode as well. Uh, so this, I get the player input. Uh, associated input is what I'm going to call this. And then we also have a on device regained event mode again with a player input associated input uh, so if we take a look we can see what sort of information we have inside this uh, so we can see what sort of uh, devices are there all different things like of that uh, we can also see if the uh, control scheme was changed so what I'm going to do is put some debug logs here. Lost and debug log gained, just so we can see uh, what when when those things actually activate. So we can hook these up. So device lost on device lost and on device regained. So let's see what we get initially. Okay, so with those events connected up, we can see what happens where, okay, so I've got controller plugged in and I can be trying to move around. I need to make sure I've got the window active. Uh, so that's, that's working. I can see that, yep. I can move. Let's unplug the controller. So unplug it. I get the lost message. Uh, I can still move around though. I plug the controller back in. Uh, we haven't gotten the gained message yet and we can still see over in the debug. Uh, the control scheme there is still saying keyboard and mouse. Uh, but then I can start to move around and we'll see the control scheme changes to gamepad. Uh, so, but if I then do mouse input or keyboard input, it switches to that. So what you might find is you, the lost will come out through reliably. Gained, not always going to be the uh, most reliable one, uh, but the controls changed one is quite a useful one. So with that, on controls changed, event mode, player input, associated input, and what I could output is my associated input and the current control scheme, and I believe Current control scheme, ah, it's just handily a string. So this would allow me to, I can check this, because this is very specific defined values of what this can be. Uh, and that will tell me what the active control scheme is. So what I often do when I'm displaying sort of tool tips, you know, here's how to actually the controls for something. 
uh, I use the on controls change and I update whatever I'm showing based upon what the user has been recently using. Because um, what that means is, so it'll be up and running. I click the mouse, not seeing anything extra there. I'm going to turn collapse back on. Now I've got my controller. I second I do any input with the controller, it tells me the input is gamepad. I stop using the controller, switches back to keyboard and mouse. I switch back to this, I'm seeing gamepad. If I unplug the controller, then I can see I get the lost message. And then as soon as I do any keyboard movement, we get keyboard and mouse. So plugging the controller back in, so it's currently keyboard and mouse. Second I press N key, that binds to an action. It needs to make sure I'm actually active in the view there. Switches to gamepad. So the current control scheme is a really handy way of being able to know uh, what particular system is active, because as soon as you do anything with something, it will change to that. Uh, so I use that for putting up context sensitive tips uh, so that it says, okay, you know, it might be the Xbox button or it might be the uh, whichever button. That all that makes an easy way for working with that. The final thing I want to show you is that we can very easily do haptic feedback with the new input system. And I'm going to do this in a way that is probably going to be really annoying to use, uh, but we'll be able to see anyway. So what I can say is, say I want to do haptics for the gamepad. Uh, I can say gamepad, current, set motor speeds. So we have two motors there, a low frequency and a high frequency. So the low frequency one is good for doing sort of kathunk style ones. So ones that are really solid, heavy, chunky movements. And then the high frequency one is great for doing ones that are more sort of buzzing style ones. But we can control each of them and we give them a zero to one value. So what I am going to do, and this is going to be this, I kind of almost want to make a game that uses this because it would be the most annoying uh, movement scheme around that as you are moving, it actually is using that to control the haptics. Uh, I wouldn't want to play a game that does that. Uh, I kind of want to make a game that does that. But this is all we need to do. We set the motor speeds. Uh, setting it to zero will turn them off. We can also, with those motor speeds in terms of uh, functions, uh, we can just you know set them to zero ourselves. Uh, is an effective thing, but if we disconnect a controller or stuff like of that, the game stops. The input system will typically return them to zero as well. So let's run that. So this is going to be probably really horrendous to use. <laughs> let's find out. Uh, this may be the worst idea I've ever had. So moving up, so we can hear the motor there. If I just move to the right, so X is our low speed, low frequency one, the more kathunky one, to use the technical term. So this is the, the kathunky. And then the moving up is going to control the high frequency one, so more the buzzy one, which is what we've got there. And if I move up and to the right, then it's a really not pleasant movement experience. I would not play a game for long, but that was the movement scheme in it. Uh, but, and I'm going to disconnect that controller before I end up sending it just vibrating through my desk, uh, which would be less than desirable, I feel. So let's recap the input system stuff. So the input system is a package that we need to add in via the package manager. With the input system, we can work with it in a polled method uh, where we are specifically checking particular keys and we can be querying against those. 
Uh, so we have the same mechanisms there for was is something being held down? Is something pressed this frame? Is it released this frame? We've got access to all of those. Uh, we can also use it in a setup where we are using a player input and we have these this input action asset which allows us to configure different schemes based on the context that it's being used in, whether that's being used in, you know, say first person or controlling a vehicle, um, different types of vehicles. We can just set up different schemes there. Those work across the different platforms. Uh, we can control how they get interpreted. So we can have composite ones. So like WASD is there as a composite one where the different components uh, contribute to it. So this idea of composite ones is something it understands. It's a digital normalized one. So it's going to be uh, a minus one to one range for the X and Y components, but the vector, its magnitude is never going to be over one. That's why when I move in diagonals using the uh, input action, I'm moving at the same speed as if I had the, the stick pressed fully up, whereas with the just the polling based method, because I wasn't doing anything fancy there, uh, diagonals, it could move faster. And there are some games where you do actually see that happen. It's an intentional thing. So input actions work cross platform, really easy to configure. Uh, when we're working with those input actions, we can use a send message based approach. Uh, where with that we can have functions that we directly work with with send message based approach uh, parameter is an input value. We can also work with it in a event based approach, which would allow us to send that data to multiple things at the same point in time. Uh, when we're using the event based approach, we have these the parameter is now an input action callback context. Uh, for picking up on the data and we can read the information in a similar way. We can get notifications when we are you know, having a device that's connected or disconnected and whatever the current control scheme is, which that current control scheme is, what was the last input source uh, that was relevant, uh, which can be an easy way for checking, okay, is that control scheme a gamepad? If it is, put up the particular gamepad. Uh, control scheme and we could check further if is it a PlayStation one, is it an Xbox one, to the different types of ones we could easily be detecting that. Uh, when we're working with buttons you know we can read our value as a button but we need to remember there that keyboard and mouse those fire buttons are typically a digital thing they're on or off whereas when we're working with a controller that input actually is a zero to one range and it has a threshold where and we'll be able to you know see that that has it has that threshold which that's linked to the trigger button um, and so it's automatically going to be saying well if that input is below 0.5 it's not pressed if it's above 0.5 then it is triggered um, so we get multiple values coming through there for it. So we get false for a bunch and then we get true for a bunch. It's something just, just remember if we're doing stuff where we've got a fire rate, we can't just rely on, hey, we got this thing come through and we, we read the value as being true, so fire. You need to have cooldown, something like of that. Uh, we often work with these where we, with a new input system, we cache the value and then we make use of it later in update or fixed update or things like of that. Uh, the new input system lets us easily work with haptics. For example, for gamepads haptics, we can just directly set the motor speeds, zero to one values, easy to work with. Uh, and it will automatically turn them off typically when you stop, but nice practice to only be doing those haptics over a short range of time and then make sure you're turning them off. Um, so really easy to work with. We looked at two methods here for working with it with using the, the action maps and everything. We can also set up uh, just standalone configurable assets for imp an input action on something. Uh, so we can actually just create, for example, a serialized field input action jump action. And if I do this, then what we will see 
is I actually get a variable that I can configure. So I've got jump action, and then I can say add binding, and I can, similar to the uh, process for the other ones, I can go and say, well, I want this to, uh, I can type in the particular key, so you can search, so spacebar. So now I have this bound to that, uh, I could set up different processes if I wanted, but a really handy way of actually sort of working with these, it's action type, I could set it to button. And then, so this is useful for if you've got something where it's not a player input, but it's some other thing that you want to be able to configure actions for, uh, which we can also configure them here. There is a bit of a syntax that lets you configure them. So with the jump actions, to be able to, well, any of those input actions, we can then link it to particular things. And we can see we can link it to it being cancelled. Uh, performed is the typical one I would link to. So we can have performed, and then we can see the syntax for that. It's exactly the same as our events here. So uh, void on jump action performed. Input action, call back context. And we can just link it up like this. And then we would be saying in here, debug log, jump context, and read value as a button. So let's see what we get with that. So this is just a method for linking stuff up if we're not wanting to use the player input thing, if we're just wanting to be setting up a, a bunch of different extra ones. So we've got this running. So with it running, now I'm pressing the jump and I don't actually see it showing up. Uh, and that's because I need to not just bind uh, these actions here, I need to actually enable them. So when you set up custom actions like of this, you have to turn them on. Uh, otherwise they're actually switched off by default, so they won't be listening for any input, which can be useful because they give you ones that you can contextually then turn off and on as needed. So now I press the button, I get true. So I only get it when it activate. Uh, and again, I could be changing that behavior, I could be setting up so I've got you know all different types of actions here, I've got the different bindings I can be setting up, really handy for being able to work with this. So different methods of how we work with it. Uh, player input is obviously geared towards if you're doing a player controller, but if you had something where you were just wanting to pick up the input, then you can set up a input action you can configure that in the inspector. The key things for using those input actions is you generally link to performed and to make sure you enable them. Otherwise, they're not going to run. Uh, so that's the key stuff with the new input system. Dive in, experiment with it. Remember, it has all of those sample projects as well. So take a look at the sample projects, experiment with them, and see what you can put together with them. Thanks folks, that is all for this video. If you're looking for the project, you'll be able to find it up on GitHub, and I've put a link to that in the description below. If you've got any feedback, any questions, please chuck in a comment. And if you're looking to find ways to support the channel, chucking in a like or subscribing to the channel is always a big help. If you're looking to go further than that, then I do have a Patreon set up and any support there is super appreciated. And there's a bunch of different things that you're, you'll get as part of being a, a patron there. And the big thing is it's gonna help me make more cool things like this, which is gonna help more people uh, like yourself to be making more games, which is awesome. And that is, that, is, that is all for now. Thank you.